I'm Terry Corwin. I'm the Executive Director with the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. It's a delight to see you tonight. We uh, ha have probably at least one thing in common, those of us in this room and those of us watching us on uh, community TV. I would speculate that we all have a deep abiding love of Santa Cruz County. That's probably why you're here. That's why I'm here. I wonder, why do we have that response? And it certainly has to do with the spectacular beauty of our natural and our working landscapes. We, have, we are, live in a biodiversity hotspot. We have a diverse array of plants and animals, some of them found nowhere else in the world. You can go surf a break, world-class break in the morning and take a hike in ancient redwoods in the afternoon. You can shop at a farmer's market and buy locally grown produce and meats. You can buy locally grown Forest Stewardship Council Redwood to build your home or your garden gate. The natural abundance of our area supports our two economic major drivers, agricultural and tour, agriculture and tourism. Surely this must be paradise, is it not? <laughs> it is. So a couple of years ago at the Land Trust, we set up uh, gave ourselves a question basically how can we pass on how can we help pass on this place that we love to the future generation and that basically embarked us upon the journey about what we're here to talk to talk to you about tonight the conservation blueprint i'd first like to introduce a special guest mr fred keely who's going to make a few remarks fred is i'm sure you probably know is our um, county treasurer but he's also was a uh, state assembly member and speaker pro tem he authored the two largest park and environmental protection bonds in the nation's history. A steadfast environmental advocate, a longtime land trust supporter. He's also on the Sempervirens board and on the a Cal Ocean Science trustee. And very importantly, I think, he's on the leadership council of California Forward that's addressing a bipartisan and diverse group of leaders addressing the California governance challenges. This is really a privilege to be here. This is a part of that maxim, I guess, or that, that, that axiom that um, at moments like this, you make sure you invite somebody who had nothing to do with it, uh, with the wonderful product that, that you're cranking out here and, and distributing and unveiling tonight. I wanna thank everybody who did, and I'll bet if I asked each one of you, every one of you contributed towards uh, the conservation blueprint in some way, shape, or form. I was speaking with a person who took it from the big version down to the small version, uh, uh, Stephen, who's in the back, and was complimenting him on, on the document because it is one of those documents uh, which, however it is how you learn as a person, um, however old you are, however your, whatever your level of sophistication, you can get it out of that uh, what looks like a very thin document. It's terribly well put together, and, and, and congratulations and thank you to all of you who contributed towards it. Um, a couple of, of quick comments. Uh, one is, uh, what is the urgency of all this? Is this really important to, 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 to do any of this? Uh, look, we, if you fly over Santa Cruz County or drive down Highway 1 or you know, go by on a, you know, a surf paddleboard and whatever, it probably looks more or less to you like it did a few years ago or a few years before that or a few years before that. Uh, certainly, if you stand on the, on the landward side and look at the ocean, uh, it looks superficially very much like it did 20,000, 100,000, 300,000 years ago. Uh, but really, the, there is an insidious aspect uh, of our lifetimes and our spans of, 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 of attention about these things, and that is uh, that it is changing very rapidly. Some of it's very hard to see. The groundwater, hard to see that. What's going on in the ocean, hard to see that. Uh, the subtleties in the complex nature of a redwood forest. Hard to see that, but they are all, in fact, measurable, observable, and what we know in all cases is that they need various kinds of protection, conservation, preservation, stewardship. And the stewardship notion is the one I'd like to share with you, and that is, we really do, in these public trust resources, the air, the water, the ocean, those are public trust resources we inherited. We get them for a little while, and the idea is to hand them on better than we found it, 
not let's use our portion of it and hand it on in a diminished capacity to the next gen. The idea is, can we actually, with the advances in science, with the advances in our own understanding and commitment to the relationships that exist in these very compound, complex ways, is that knowledge going to do us some good? It does us some good if we act on it. So if we use a conservation blueprint, which says there's absolutely a role for the private sector, for the private landowner, for the nonprofit agency, for a land trust, for the state of California, we all have a role. Understanding that role, agreeing on the principles involved, where no one's asked to compromise their principles, but everyone's asked to reach a principled compromise with a set of values. Those principles are a set of values that are rooted in the notion that we are, in fact, going to pass all of this along better than we found it. And that's the urgency. This world is changing at a pace that is easy to see in some respects. For example, the, the droid that I set over there so it didn't go off while I'm talking, that literally has more computing power in it than the United States Army had in Vietnam. Think about that in my hand. We know those kinds of changes and how fast they happen in technology. The changes that are going on in our environment are uneven in their pace of change, but what is undeniable is the acceleration of the pace of change. And so it does become then incumbent upon us, perhaps more than previous generations, as the population of the planet grows, as the pressures on our environment grow, as our interests in food security grow, as all of the pacing of that and the velocity of that picks up, then the urgency of conservation picks up in a parallel fashion. So my thought tonight is thank you. Thank you for participating in this process to this point. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for what it is you are going to do on a going forward basis that folks will tell you about tonight. Thank you for being part of this community. Thanks, Fred. You nailed it. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our Director of Conservation, Matt Freeman. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to present some elements of the Conservation Blueprint to you tonight. Our team has been working on this for um, almost two years now, and I think we could talk about any one of the elements that we're going to cover tonight. It would take hours. So this is going to be a very, very high-level overview. For the rest of the program, Jody McGraw and I are going to talk about just some of the, the key issues we looked at in the Conservation Blueprint, some of the major goals and objectives, some of the key findings, um, and then recommendations moving forward to implement the Blueprint. So what is the Conservation Blueprint? In a nutshell, it represents a comprehensive inventory and assessment of the natural and agricultural resources in Santa Cruz County. We looked at biodiversity, water, uh, recreation, community health, and agriculture and working lands. We were able to build on so many successful plans and studies that have been completed in Santa Cruz County. We took advantage of a wealth of existing data and information that was already there. We conducted a number of workshops with experts, we involved the community, and we put a report together that identifies some of the most important places to focus conservation efforts over the next 25 or so years. The blueprint will absolutely guide the work of the land trust in the next couple of decades, and we really, really hope that it'll be um, a valuable resource for other organizations, agencies, and other conservation partners that are working to protect the beautiful resources in this wonderful county. All of the information um, that we're going to share tonight is in the report. All of the maps are available on the Land Trust website. You can download them. But more importantly, in creating the blueprint, we tried to build something, a dynamic tool that can be added to and expanded as new information becomes available. To do that, we, we created the blueprint using computer mapping technology called 
geographic information systems, and all of the data layers that were used to create the maps will be available on the Land Trust website um, for download. And using some tools, you'll be able to combine these maps and create some custom maps of your own. The project was generously and graciously funded in large part by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. That organization was founded in 2000, and they're dedicated to environmental conservation and cutting edge science. Um, globally, but they have a particular interest in the Bay Area. I want to acknowledge our program officer with the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, and that was Gary Nonblack. Gary has a remarkable vision and an ability to understand who's doing what, where, and then to put those efforts together. And Gary really understood that uh, Santa Cruz County represented a missing gap in the knowledge of the Bay Area about conservation priority. So really huge kudos to Gary Knobloch. Um, the project was also funded by the Resources Legacy Fund. Um, they were able to allow us to commission some unique new research related to habitat connectivity, and we were able to look at development potential looking forward in Santa Cruz County too, thanks to their funding. And the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County um, uh, allowed us to engage the community and hold a number of workshops throughout the county. And I think most importantly, um, the project was made possible by the members and donors of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. Their support allowed our staff to really engage deeply on this issue. We went a little bit over uh, schedule and a little bit over budget, and it, it would not have been possible without our donors and funders. So if any of you here are members of the Land Trust, thank you so much. This image, um, I think, helps speak to what this project is all about. The Nine County Bay Area has had a lot of cutting edge conservation planning occurring, conspicuous missing bite out of the map that represents Santa Cruz County. And this is part of um, Gary Knobloch's vision. He really understood that. And the purpose of this project in large part, large part is to complete the missing gap in this larger um, Bay Area. Ecosystems transcend political boundaries, and so it's really important to take a regional approach to conservation. So our aim in taking on this project was to develop a state-of-the-art conservation plan that, again, that fills in that gap. And then by understanding um, some of the conservation priorities in Santa Cruz County and the region allows um, funders to strategically invest their scarce dollars in the most important conservation projects across the entire Bay Area. In doing so, um, our aim is to make the most informed um, conservation choices, to focus our resources strategically on the highest priority areas, and to advance the basically the scope and scale of conservation, um, really engaging our partners in this work, and attracting our fair share of public agency and private foundation funding to Santa Cruz County to implement some important conservation projects. But most importantly, this project is about the next generation. It's about leaving a legacy for future generations. And as Fred mentioned, leaving a world that's in better shape than the condition in which we inherited it. We had a really, really wonderful team working on this project. I feel incredibly privileged to work with the folks on screen there, um, including Dr. Jody McGraw, who is an absolutely phenomenal ecologist. And she might deny this, but she's a hell of a good conservation planner too. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the project director, Andrea McKenzie. Uh, Andrea had a prior engagement. She couldn't be here tonight. But Andrea also had a really remarkable vision. And she was so motivated to develop a planning process that was both strategic and forward thinking, as well as very, very practical and down to earth. If we'd had the time and the budget, I know that Andrea would have us be working to you know, come up with the, the most cutting edge, next best thing. Um, and that's exactly what she's doing. Um, Andrea got a position with the Santa Clara County Open Space Authority as their general manager. We expect that she's going to do remarkable things there. And we know that we have a really wonderful partner um, in the Open Space Authority as we embark on some regional conservation planning projects. And we were also incredibly fortunate to have a wonderful steering committee. Um, we got a group of seven very inspirational folks together to work with a planning team to develop the conservation blueprint. Um, these folks represent um, the whole gamut of the topics that we looked at in the blueprint. Biodiversity, working lands, community health and recreation, water resources. The steering committee also encompasses a number of different sectors from public agencies, private sector, 
nonprofit and academia. And they worked really closely with us to develop our goals and objectives, to make sure that we are on the right track in terms of our methodology and approaches. And then most importantly, they vetted our recommendations and findings. And in many cases, these values uh, are in competition. Balancing water resources and agriculture and biodiversity is incredibly challenging. And the steering committee was instrumental in having us and helping us walk that fine line. I'm not sure they knew what they were getting into um, in terms of the complexity and the timing associated with this project. Uh, we wore, wore many of them out. I think John Ricker may be our only steering committee member here this evening, but I'd like to give John Ricker a hand. Thank you very much, John. John works for the County um, Environmental Health Department and manages the Water Resources Program. And I learned so much from John. While John knows pretty much everything there is to know about water in Santa Cruz County and more, he also knows everything about the environment and agriculture. And so it was a real privilege to work with John on this. Our process, so in addition to the steering committee, um, we held a number of workshops. We had eight large workshops um, that dealt with the conservation values that I talked about. And then we uh, went out into the community. We had four workshops in different parts of the county so we could hear from the public about the areas that were of interest to them and the environmental issues that were of interest to them to factor really as much of a kind of a, a community perspective into the project that we could. When we drafted our report, uh, we put it online in February and spent a couple of months receiving feedback from the community um, and from our partners and um, were able to integrate a lot of really, really good information that I think greatly increased the quality of the final project. I'd like to share this map just for context. Santa Cruz County has had a truly remarkable legacy of land protection. Currently, over 77,000 acres are protected in the form of public parks, open space preserves, or conservation easements. State parks alone covers more than 45,000 acres in the county. And most of us who live in or around Santa Cruz really appreciate the incredible green belt of parks and open spaces um, around that city. So this is the starting place, this 77,000 acres of a conservation network in the county, about a quarter of the land in protected status. And this is where we started when we began working on a vision to identify what a conservation lands network could look like 25 or 30 years from now. And so we conducted that analysis through these four filters. Again, biodiversity, water resources, agriculture and working lands, and recreation and healthy communities. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to Jody McGraw, and she'll talk in more detail about biodiversity, and then I'll come back and I'll talk about some of these other topics. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to share with you a bit about the biodiversity component of the blueprint. Um, I just want to echo uh, what Matt said, which is that this is really uh, just the tip of the iceberg, what we're sharing with you, and really encourage you, hope that your interest will be piqued and you'll have an opportunity to take a look at the documents and, and what they contain. So Santa Cruz County uh, has a wealth of native biodiversity. Uh, it's the second smallest county in the state, second only to the city and county of San Francisco. And yet we have t t more than 1,200 native plant species. That's about a fifth of what's found statewide. And we have a third of the statewide moss flora and 350 species of birds call Santa Cruz County home. And among those species are 32 plants and animals that are found nowhere else but in our county. And I hasten to add that those are just the species that scientists have described and have been recognized. And what we found in working with the technical advisors on this project is that there's many other plants and animals that have yet to be described. And so many have just been recently described. And so really, uh, I really, it goes to what Fred shared, which is we're just taking a snapshot in time at this. The blueprint is but a snapshot in time, and it's important to, to keep that in mind. And when we talk about biodiversity, we're not just talking about the species, but it's also, or the communities, it's also the ecological and ecosystem processes that sustain them. And by that, you know, we mean the, the hydrological cycle and system, the natural disturbances such as fire, which are important to maintain many plant and animal communities in our county. Uh, things like decomposition, which m people don't mostly want to think about, but it's essential. Where would we be without it? <laughs> um, and of course, uh, you know, pollination. All these systems are critical, and they sustain not just the plants and animals, but 
that are so critical to us, all of us, our, our, our human systems, our communities, our economic systems, our agriculture, are all reliant on these biological systems. And so conservation planning for biodiversity in Santa Cruz County was a big task. And, and so I wanted to give you a, a feel for some of the things uh, that the team came up with and some of the recommendations, which really centered around four main uh, interrelated goals. The first is to conserve the globally rare and locally unique systems. Uh, and I'll talk about all of these in more detail. The second is recognizing that it's not enough just to save the rare systems and species, but also that we need to conserve representative areas of the more common systems to sustain those species and also for those ecosystem services. And third, it matters where we protect habitat. Connectivity is emerging as a major issue and concern, and people are recognizing that without well-connected protected lands, that we're not able to conserve things that we thought were protected. And the fourth one is working towards building in resiliency into our conservation network the, in, the, in the face of global climate change and other things that threaten viability of the systems, which I'll share a little bit more about. Santa Cruz County is a home to numerous plant communities, uh, animal, uh, fauna, and all, also a myriad a range of biodiversity that's found nowhere else in the world. There are several systems that are only here and a lot of systems that are barely found elsewhere. And so a key goal of the blueprint is securing the viability of those systems. It really comes from the notion of what we heard from the technical advisors in the community that if we don't protect these things, who will? And so just to give you a flavor for some of them, there's, uh, there's many more and they're described in the blueprint, but the Santa Cruz Cypress Forest is known from only 220 acres worldwide and 210 acres of that forest is found in Santa Cruz County. And so it's critically important uh, that we protect those, uh, that community. The Santa Cruz Sound Hills, 6,000 acres globally, and all of that is within the county, uh, located in the center part uh, near the communities of Ben Loman and Scotts Valley. And these species that are shown here are all endemic to the Sand Hills, so they're not found anywhere else but on those uh, 6,000 acres of habitat. And so this map illustrates here the efforts that we took, undertook as part of the blueprint to synthesize all the available information about where the globally rare and locally unique communities occur. And having this sort of atlas of biodiversity is a critical tool, as Matt pointed out, for, for implementing the blueprint, for attaining the goals, and also for many of you working on uh, other conservation projects, hopefully to, to work on uh, related projects. So there's more than 34,000 acres we identified that support either a, a unique or rare plant community type or animal species in the county. And these are not just the terrestrial systems, but we have very important uh, aquatic systems as well. And so uh, streams are one of the things that we studied. There's 850 miles of streams in our coastal county, most of which flow to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, these streams are, are very important for fish, uh, frogs, uh, and, all, and all sorts of terrestrial species like deer that rely on the water. Santa Cruz County also has a diversity of wetlands. Uh, kind of most well known are the Watsonville Sloughs, which are more than 800 acres, kind of statewide conservation priority that's been identified for the diversity and, uh, of species that they support, including the birds. Uh, Santa, the Wet Watsonville Sloughs are part of an important um, flyway, the Pacific Flyway, for migrating uh, water birds. And of course, ponds. We identified every pond we can find <laughs> through our analysis, not just the really important complexes of ponds like down uh, in the Larkin Valley area which are really important for some species but also just every stock pond because these ponds we're finding are really important for a lot of um, animals who again need to drink water but they're critically important for pond breeding amphibians like the California red-legged frog and one of our near endemic species the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander. This map here you'll find in the blueprint identifies the important aquatic systems, and it includes the ponds, the wetlands, the uh, lakes, and reservoirs, and also it identify it provides the results of an analysis of all the uh, local fish fisheries experts and other aquatic resource experts who we convene to help us identify the highest priority watersheds in the county. All of our watersheds are critically important in one way or another, but looking across, we wanted to see are there others that are more important. Some that are more important than others, and they helped us identify those, like the, the ones shown in dark blue are critical for coho salmon and also for steelhead, and those are some of the first priorities that we identified. 
So recognizing that it's not it's going to be sufficient, to, but it's very important to conserve the globally unix um, systems, but not sufficient. We also identified the second goal of conserving the broad range of representative biological systems that are found within the county, again, both for the other species that they support and also for us, for the ecosystem services that they provide. So the, the blueprint identified more than uh, 24,000 acres of oak woodlands, uh, which are a very important community for a lot of wildlife. Acorns are very important for, for many species. And of course, our redwood forests. Uh, I think 43% of the county uh, is covered by redwood forests. Uh, and these are very important uh, for a lot of species, but also a really key uh, contributor to our ecosystem services, which include filtering water. Uh, most residents of Santa Cruz County, uh, the vast majority, I should say, get their water from water sources within our county. And the redwood forests are critical in filtering that water, but they also help purify our air, removing particulates like dust and also, as you probably well know now, um, pollutants like uh, global warming gases like carbon dioxide. And again, got to focus on that decomposition. Cycling our nutrients, there's all sorts of species that play really critical roles in that. And pollination of crops. Uh, many birds, um, as well as a ton of insects, live in the forest and are sustained by the forest and other communities, and then provide important uh, services in terms of pollinating agricultural crops like our apples. So as part of the blueprint, we compiled, worked with our technical advisors, many of who are in the room today, thank you, um, for, uh, to identify the best vegetation map that we could create based on available data and, and, and enhanced with local knowledge. And the vegetation map um, calls out more than 20 communities, each of which we assigned a protection goal, a goal for which having that, a certain percentage of that community protected uh, within a future a network of conservation lands. Now, where you protect those lands uh, should be informed, at least in part, by the desire to connect lands. We recognize in the blueprint that it's not just necessary to maintain, but we actually need to enhance connectivity of habitat within the county in order to sustain uh, the wide-ranging species and also those uh, processes. Uh, connectivity is critical for um, species, like I mentioned, like the mountain lion, but also the badger and mule deer that require large areas that can't subsist on just small patches of habitat. And it's also important for maintaining the ecosystem services and, and processes that maintain the habitat, like fire. If we have a fragmented landscape, those, those processes won't continue. And so, as Matt mentioned, one of the critical components of the blueprint was a novel analysis that was conducted along with uh, Adina Marylander at UC Berkeley to identify the ha remaining habitat patches within the county and then uh, to help determine how we can, we can best connect them. And so this map here illustrates some of the largest habitat patches we identified, including a more than 70,000 acre patch that straddles the northern part of Santa Cruz County and southern San Mateo County. And as you can see by looking at the map, there's um, several, uh, it sort of creates a stepping stone network where um, if we can maintain permeability between these large patches, that will allow species to move within the county and more, and perhaps as importantly, within the larger ecoregion, the Santa Cruz Mountains. Those are the blue arrows there. And then the green arrows identify another important aspect of the connectivity analysis, which is maintaining um, the ability of species to move uh, between the Santa Cruz Mountains and adjacent mountain ranges. So the, um, the, the Gabalon Range to the south and the Mount Hamilton Range to the east. Uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains alone aren't big enough to sustain uh, a lot of populations, like species like mountain lions. So it's critical to maintain that connectivity. And the fourth goal, as I mentioned, addresses the fact that within, uh, the, by the end of the century, the climate in California is predicted to be eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Uh, and so that's going to create a hotter, obviously, conditions, but also likely drier conditions and are currently somewhat moist uh, and cool maritime county. And, and so a key thing we recognize in the blueprint is it's going to be critical to work to maintain resiliency and allow species that are living in this county to adapt to those changes. So one of the analyses uh, that we did was looking at identifying what we call climate refugia. These are just areas that are likely to be more climatically stable and allow species that are adapted to the conditions now to persist in that hotter, drier climate. And not surprisingly, one of those areas is wet areas, springs, seeps, ponds, streams. 
these areas are not only going to provide necessary limited water, but they also have a cooler microclimate. Another area that has uh, other areas that have cool microclimates are north-facing slopes. We're in the northern hemisphere, and we have a very mountainous terrain, and so there's um, obviously ridges like this. If you look at it from the top, you can see that on the south-facing slope that gets a lot more direct sunlight, they provide habitat for species adapted to kind of more uh, direct sunlight. But on the north-facing slopes, there can be a totally different plant and animal assemblages. And so maintaining those north-facing slopes can create opportunities uh, for species to persist that are uh, adapted to perhaps the hotter conditions now, but they might be um, uh, too hot later on. So this map here you'll see in the blueprint identifies those areas of climate res resiliency, north facing slopes, wet areas, and also you'll see that the patches have been mapped according to the steepness of the elevation gradient. This basically gets at the idea that uh, we have mountainous terrain and, and um, um, steeper elevation gradients can allow species to move from near sea level all the way up to over 3,000 feet in elevation. And these patches by being intact can also allow species to move closer or farther from the coast. And and also farther north. All of those things will, could confer resiliency in a, in a future hotter, drier climate. Now, as you're probably beginning to um, imagine, our analysis together um, identified that pretty much every square inch of intact habitat in Santa Cruz County has some value for biodiversity. And so what we heard from a lot of our technical advisors is that we need to find some way to kind of roll this up and identify priorities. And so the last thing we did was develop this important areas for biodiversity map. It was based on an analysis that essentially overlays some of the uh, mapped components that you've seen previously, the important habitat habitat patches, the areas for climate resiliency, the globally rare systems, uh, and several others. And the darker um, the area in this map here, the more of those unique important components that are featured in that area. And so this allows us to focus, as Matt said, the limited conservation resources to areas that can and then can provide the most benefit, sort of the, the biggest bang for the buck. So I, focus my limited time with you today on kind of giving you a survey of the key findings. Um, but I do want to encourage you to, ch to take a look at the bl blueprint and read more about what, what the blueprint provides that we should do. And this again came from our technical advisors helping us identify the best strategies to attain those goals and some actions to, to, for under each of those strategies. So for each of the four goals, there's four main strategies. One is to protect habitat, protect it from development and other factors that would degrade it. Another one is to steward the existing habitat we have. We have such an amazing amount of habitat that's already protected, and so much of which needs critical help uh, to maintain the biodiversity values that it, that it currently supports. A third one is to continue to study and learn more. We, we really realize that there's, there's, for example, the maritime chaparral communities in our county. Everyone agreed we don't even know how many different communities we have. And so there's just some areas where people were just adamant we just need to learn more in order to effectively conserve these resources. And fourth is to educate and to uh, realizing that this, this is going to be a long-term uh, implementation plan and, and having increased awareness and support for what we've learned as part of this process will no doubt help facilitate uh, successful attainment of those goals. And so I've listed some example actions here just to give you a flavor for some of the things that the blueprint recommends. Under protection, we obviously have protecting you know, as much as possible some of those globally rare areas. Some of them are really critically imperiled, and, and so those are a, a key priority. Developing a coordinated management strategies, meaning across um, jurisdictional areas, is going to be really important for things like weeds. It doesn't make sense to manage within just one ownership. We need to manage these countywide. Another one was looking at connectivity. We realized that we have a great kind of starting point with the analysis that we did, but we really need to drill down and work in a multidisciplinary way, including with transportation agencies, to identify some of the critical impediments to, to connectivity in our county. And finally, conducting a detailed climate viability analysis is something that could help us understand what systems are the most threatened and imperiled uh, by the future hotter, drier climate in our county, so we can maybe focus some, some energies towards those as well. The next topic we'll cover tonight is water resources. And, and water is obviously vital to every aspect of our lives. And it's, it's the essential link between the natural and built environments. One of the most important water resource issues confronting Santa Cruz County is long-term availability of water. I didn't realize this going into the Blueprint Project, um, but Santa Cruz County is almost entirely reliant upon local water supplies. 
Um, while desalination is being considered as an alternative to augment water supplies, there aren't any long-term plans for a regional pipeline. And so the water we rely on for 256,000 residents for drinking water and to meet the needs of industry and to drive our largely agricultural-based economy absolutely relies on the long-term availability of these local supplies you know, to meet our current and our, our future needs. So thinking about that issue um, led to development of some of our overarching conservation goals. And it's really about protecting long-term water supplies protecting water quality, and also ensuring the long-term integrity of watersheds. And these goals are all interrelated, of course, by protecting our watersheds. It's one of the most important things we can do to protect the headwaters of our streams, where the streams originate, um, and that will also protect water quality in addition to addressing flood control and addressing some of the issues Jody mentioned earlier about providing long-term resilience to climate change. And there are so many other water resource issues uh, facing Santa Cruz County. This image is it's really hard to look at. This um, uh, is definitely worthy of some additional study at your leisure when you have the map in front of you. Um, one of the most significant issues is overdraft. 80% of the water that's consumed in Santa Cruz County comes from three underground groundwater basins. And these are all in a state of overdraft. They're shown on this map in brown. So you can get an idea of the geographic extent of the county that's subject to overdraft. Um, and it's particularly um, critical in the Pajaro Valley. Virtually all of the water that's used for our agricultural industry comes from the Pajaro Valley. Um, and it's in a state of tremendous overdraft. We're essentially mining our groundwater faster than it can be replenished <laughs> naturally. Um, some estimates by Dr. Andy Fisher, UC Santa Cruz, estimate that the state of overdraft could be 20 to 40% beyond um, the sustainable yield. And so that means it's gonna require a tremendous amount of change to get our water use back in balance. Many, many other issues as well. Uh, one symptom of overdraft is seawater intrusion. Um, the Paro Valley Water Management Agency has been doing testing of groundwater wells throughout the Paro Valley, and they've identified the intrusion of groundwater uh, I'm sorry, of seawater as much as two miles inland. And as this continues in response to overdraft, it really threatens to contaminate the quality of the wells that are used, and it could threaten the long-term viability of, of some farmlands in the Pajaro Valley. And our surface waters are in trouble in many places as well. The Regional Water Quality Control Board has identified over, I think it's 18 streams that don't meet water quality standards. They're impaired in terms of sediment from poorly drained road networks. Um, uh, some, some of that sedimentation is from timber harvesting or other agricultural practices. Um, other forms of impairment come from pathogens, from septic tanks. I live in the San Lorenzo Valley, and the San Lorenzo Valley has the distinction of having over 13,000 septic systems. And I understand that's the highest concentration in the state. And uh, at a previous meeting, someone shouted, it's the highest concentration of septic tanks probably in the country. Um, so uh, another major issue there. And of course, there are some runoff from the widespread agriculture in the Pajaro Valley. And of course, virtually all of the streams in Santa Cruz County drain into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And everywhere in the county is downstream of another point. What we do upstream has a serious impact on downstream water quality and ultimately the quality of the Monterey Bay. I guess a final issue I'll mention regarding water resources is coastal erosion and flooding. Uh, currently, episodic flooding occurs in the Pajaro Valley in response to huge storm events. But what's really interesting and a little bit scary is the potential impact of climate change and sea level rise and more sudden and severe storms that have greater intensity that don't allow the water to slowly percolate and absorb into the groundwater. Um, some studies show that portions of the lower Pajaro River um, will become inundated, and, and this isn't in addition to some of the flooding. So this is a, a dramatic change that could also in, exacerbate seawater intrusion and threaten water quality. So a, a host of issues we're, we're dealing with. There are some opportunities. Uh, the blueprint identified 
some uh, really important areas to focus conservation in the future to protect water resources. Um, some of the most important areas include water supply, watersheds. So these are the headwaters of some streams on the upper San Lorenzo River, along the North Coast streams, uh, and in the upper Coralitos Creek. And again, these are the streams where our drinking water originate. Um, there, there are important policies in place um, that the county has to protect these drinking water streams, but there are, is a huge opportunity for voluntary conservation to occur in these water supply watersheds to complement the regulations and ensure kind of the permanent protection of our drinking water. And likewise, uh, it's critical that we focus on protecting um, some of the sandy and pervious soils that allow for water uh, infiltration into the, um, into the overdrafted aquifers. Uh, these areas occur in Scotts Valley, um, in the San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, the sand hills that Jody mentioned are a phenomenal place for um, groundwater recharge to occur. And then these deposits are also scattered through the Paro Valley. And again, given the, the condition of overdraft there, it's absolutely critical that we protect these um, groundwater recharge areas, particularly in the Paro Valley. And then there are many other sort of water resources that are really important to protect for a, a variety of other reasons. Um, streams uh, have a lot of recharge that takes place within the stream channel itself. Uh, where there are there's riparian vegetation associated with streams or wetlands is also critical for flood control as well as the um, habitat benefits that result from protection there. So just a very quick overview of a few um, sample strategies and actions. There are dozens that are described for water resources in the blueprint document. I'm not even sure um, I've listed the most important ones here. But again, focusing conservation project and the sources of our drinking water and our water resources. Coordinating efforts um, for projects that link flood control, water quality, habitat restoration, and recharge. There are a number of grassroots partnerships that are occurring right now. One I'd like to note is the Paro Valley Water Community Dialogue. You may not have heard about this effort yet, but you will soon. Um, more than 60 to 70 percent of the landowners in the Paro Valley, these are the growers, recognize the state of overdraft and they are working to develop some voluntary solutions and approaches to the overdraft issue. It can include a range of strategies from increasing the rotation of crops to a longer period of time, following crops, strategically taking some lands out of production on some marginal slopes, for example, for a period of time, and a whole host of other projects, from little projects to just massive, massive ones. Um, one effort that's getting a lot of attention is the design and implementation of managed aquifer recharge projects. These are places where farmers or landowners would essentially create a basin that would allow drainage and runoff to infiltrate into the soil and recharge um, the groundwater. And the Land Trust is very interested, uh, along with other organizations and agencies, to help encourage and incentivize this effort. And so it's really exciting, and I think folks will hear a lot more about that in the next few months. And finally, taking a, a watershed approach. There are many really outstanding efforts to protect watersheds um, that have occurred in the county. A number of programs, including the Integrated Watershed uh, Resource Program that the RCD leads. Um, the county and many other agencies work on integrated water regional management, I'm sorry, integrated regional water management plans. And there are some exciting projects that are coming there too that link recharge, water quality, and water supply. Uh, a good example is the College Lake project that was funded through that um, Irwin uh, program. And then I've listed a few watersheds there that are priorities for um, kind of updated assessments and comprehensive plans to identify strategies, again, that link all of these values. And from there, I will turn to working lands uh, and agriculture. This is something that's absolutely um, critical to the Land Trust mission. And we believe that the lasting protection of the county's agricultural and working resources are, is a really critical component of, of developing a comprehensive conservation strategy. We're really fortunate to have such a unique combination of a Mediterranean climate with microclimates and perfect soils um, that has created one of the most productive areas for agriculture in the state, if not naturally or nationally. 
in 2010, the direct sales um, of agricultural commodities was over $410 million. And the agriculture commissioner gets really excited about some of the secondary economies. When you look at trucking and warehousing and shipping, there's a multiplier effect that kicks in of nearly two to three times. And so we're talking about an agricultural economy that approaches nearly a billion dollars. Again, the land trust is really devoted to this issue and we've managed to secure in conservation easements or fee ownership more than about 2,000 acres of working farmlands and, uh, and, um, and, and timber land in Santa Cruz County. We work very hard at our Watsonville Slough Farms property in Watsonville and our Burn Mill Iron Forest uh, near Coralitos to balance long-term agricultural production with protection of water quality and habitat. And we're hopeful to expand this to new areas in the future. With that in mind, some of our major goals, um, maintaining economic viability of working lands, and our strategies really revolved around uh, addressing challenges to viability. And this could be a loss of an agricultural land base, uh, increasing regulations associated with water quality or food safety, and many other issues that are confronting long-term viability of agriculture. And then working to protect the ecological integrity, the environmental values within working lands. So the streams, the wetlands, um, the habitat are, that runs through the farms and along their margins. And then taking an integrated approach, um, looking more regionally at the relationship of working lands to the properties that are next door um, to integrate farming and timber conservation you know, into a more regional management strategy that addresses connectivity and resource protection. And finally, just increasing public awareness um, about the importance of our uh, agricultural heritage and economy. A number of really important areas to focus in Santa Cruz County. The dark green areas in the south of the map near Watsonville are where our prime soils are located. About 22,000 acres of the county are considered prime soils and are, that are most productive um, for <laughs> farmland. And then there's a, a small band along the north coast. And the area is shown in red, encompass about 18,000 acres. And those are grasslands, open habitats that are more suitable um, for rangeland or cattle grazing. The blueprint also looked at timberlands. Over 71,000 acres are zoned for timber production in Santa Cruz County. They're shown on this map in the, the dark brown color. Over the last 10 or so years, about 30 acres um, had some timber harvesting occur. And timber harvesting in Santa Cruz County is, is highly regulated by both the state and the county, but we see that there is a really tremendous opportunity there to complement the regulations that are in place through voluntary programs, um, stewardship incentives, conservation easements, and the like to, again, complement the regulations that are in place to protect um, the habitat values and water quality there. So some sample strategies and actions. Looking at multi-benefit projects, you'll hear more about this in just a couple of minutes. The Pajaro Hills, the rangelands there, um, again, this is the area that covered um, nearly 18,000 acres, I think are a really good example of a multi-benefit project. Well-managed cattle grazing can be a really important landscape management tool um, that also achieves the protection of the rare grasslands that Jody mentioned earlier. And the recovery plan for the California red-legged frog attributes cattle grazing to the protection of that species because grazing results in stock ponds and stock ponds result in red-legged frog. So protecting the viability of our rangelands is a really important way to protect grassland biodiversity and rare species in addition to protecting that small but really vital part of our agricultural economy. And we're looking to develop pilot projects for payment for ecosystem service projects. Um, the Semper Virens Fund, the Nature Conservancy have both successfully used carbon offset programs to fund conservation projects. And there are uh, a number of, uh, well, there are ideas underway to explore the feasibility of launching some pilot payment for ecosystem service projects in Santa Cruz County. It's absolutely vital that we work to maintain funding for the Williamson Act program. The Williamson Act is such an important property tax incentive um, in exchange for keeping lands in agricultural production, 
farmers and working lands owner owners get a substantial tax break that um, makes it much more likely that they'll be able to afford um, to remain in agriculture as opposed to um, transitioning that property to more development or more intensive use. And finally, one of the last major um, topical areas we looked at was uh, recreation and healthy communities. And again, our parks and our open spaces um, that provide recreation are absolutely vital to our lifestyle. Um, parks provide an essential connection to nature. They serve as outdoor classrooms and provide the next generation an opportunity to understand and appreciate nature, which instills such a vital land and stewardship ethic in them. Parks and open spaces allow, uh, they provide opportunities for healthy lifestyles through outdoor recreation. And they also contribute immeasurably to our quality of life and our local economy. I think the statistic is $640 million was the, the value of the local tourist economy, which is in large part attributed to the spectacular scenery in the county that's been protected through such a wonderful network of parks and open spaces. Um, we, uh, in developing the blueprint, we convened uh, a meeting with local parks providers and chatted with them about some of the challenges they face and some of the opportunities moving forward. And I think as everyone here can appreciate, um, the, we're facing really, really difficult and challenging times financially. Our local parks providers are, are struggling to provide just basic operation and maintenance. Some, many parks are faced with closures. Everyone heard about the state parks that are facing closures. And it's really all our locals can do to provide just basic stewardship services. Uh, education programs are getting cut. And so when we conducted this workshop in late 2009 and then had some follow-ups in, in 2010, the, the situation was feeling pretty grim. It makes it a little bit more challenging, too, that um, they're looking at greater demand for access to parks just as the population grows in the future. So there aren't any, um, there's no real silver lining in the short term. Some of the goals that we developed around those issues, urban, clean, healthy, livable urban communities, funding, and creating a, a regional recreation system that's responsive to demographics. We have an aging population, we have minorities that use parks in very different ways, and it's important to provide uh, appropriate amenities and facilities to serve those different needs. And then integrating open spaces and parks into um, housing and transportation plans. So in the long run, um, when we have more funding available, there are some really exciting possibilities to grow our system of open spaces and trails. Again, we have a really excellent network of protected lands and over 231 miles of trails in Santa Cruz County right now. There was a, a wonderful recent success story associated with trails, and that was the Regional Transfer Transportation Commission's purchase of the branch rail line that runs between Davenport and Watsonville. This closes a really, really critical gap in the California Coastal Trail. This is a 1,300 mile long trail that runs the length of California. And that missing bit in Santa Cruz County was a really, really important priority of the, the Coastal Conservancy. And they're working with the Regional Transportation Commission and other partners now to fund a study to look at the feasibility of using that rail line as a, as a recreational corridor. Really, really wonderful opportunity to further connect our local communities to the coast and learn about coastal resources. Another long-term opportunity um, will be expanding connections between our communities to the ridge that defines the boundary between Santa Cruz and Santa Clara County. The Bay Area Ridge Trail um, is a, another regional trail that encircles the San Francisco Bay, but many people don't know that its southern circuit comes into Santa Cruz County. And so the parks providers we talked to are really excited about opportunities to create regional connections to the Bay Area Ridge Trail. This could um, result one day in a connection between um, downtown Aptos through the forest of Nizine Marks, through the Silk Hill Demonstration Forest, to Sierra Azul Open Space Preserve in Santa, Cruz, or Santa Clara County, and then all the way along the ridge, essentially then to Castle Rock, and to Big Basin Redwood State Park, um, down the Skyland of the Sea Trail, and then looping all the way back on the California Coastal Trail. And so a long-term vision could include 
hostels and um, hikers huts and opportunities for really significant, significant equestrian trails and other amenities like that. So there was really a, an exciting long, long-term vision to think about. One of the things that the, the park providers and, and particularly that we learned um, in talking uh, with community members during the public meetings was um, Watsonville. Uh, every, every group we talked to desired better connections between communities and schools and parks, but everyone agreed that Watsonville in particular emerged as a community that was very underserved in terms of the parks and a top priority to implement the city of Watsonville's really wonderful parks plan that they adopted last year. Um, that plan calls for uh, expanding the system of really wonderful sluice trails, and it would also result in connections to the Pajaro River levee, and then eventually to the Co California Coastal Trail, and then to the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, which runs um, south to Monterey County. Really exciting long-term opportunity. Some sample strategies and actions. Well, we have to solve the funding issue, and uh, everyone agreed that we've got to form more collaborative partnerships to take advantage of different organizations' strengths, to avoid duplication of efforts, and to scratch our heads and, and develop some meaningful funding strategies. And one of those funding strategies will certainly include trying to use the blueprint and other tools to direct funding to the Bay Area um, from future bond measures and then connecting our communities to these regional trails I mentioned, the California Coastal Trail, the Bay Area Ridge Trail, and integrating this conservation blueprint with the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments blueprint. They just completed a report called Envisioning Monterey Bay, and it identifies long-term strategies that can be employed to really develop sustainable communities. SB 375, the Sustainable Community Strategy, requires that communities address greenhouse gases and integrate goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with local housing and transportation plans. And the Land Trust's conservation blueprint can really help that effort by identifying areas that are really appropriate to protect as open space and in doing so constrain development to a smaller footprint um, that will help create more livable communities and identify alternatives to the transport to transportation or the automobile I should say and just keep things constrained in order to protect surrounding open spaces. So that's a quick overview, well, maybe not so quick, of some of the, the conservation values we looked at. To, to begin wrapping up the blueprint, we took a step back and evaluated the context, the, the regional setting um, of Santa Cruz County within the larger Monterey Bay and San Francisco Bay Area. And for this effort, we, we commissioned some research from Dr. Uh, Adina Marinlander from UC Berkeley to look at the development potential in Santa Cruz County so we could factor that into our, our plans. Taking a step back further really quickly, there are, it's fairly sobering to think about long-term population trends. The nine county San Francisco Bay Area is expected to grow by an additional two million people in the next 25 years to a, a total population of about nine million people. Closer to home in the Monterey Bay, we're looking at population growth of about 146,000 people in that same period. And that's equivalent to a city the size of Salinas. And then Santa Cruz County is projected to grow in the next 25 years by about 35,000 people. It's not phenomenal growth, but when you look at the local growth in combination with the surrounding development and population growth, you can see that it's gonna put a lot of additional pressure on water resources, new demand for water. Um, development in some areas will exacerbate runoff and water quality issues. And it threatens to encroach into some of the sensitive habitats and intact patches that Jody described earlier. So to understand how what the situation really looks like in Santa Cruz, again, we commissioned this study to look at our current general plan and to map out what development could look like based on current general plan policies. As part of that study, we looked at constraints that are identified in the general plan. That could be parcel size, slope, you know, the land use policies and ordinances, distance to streams, and many, many other factors. And what came of that analysis was this map. 
The areas in red show areas that have um, greater development potential. We estimate a range of between 17,000 and 22,000 um, new additional units could be built in Santa Cruz County based on our current general plan. And this number is borne out by a study that was conducted by Santa Cruz County a few years ago. They estimated about 17,000 new units could be constructed. And it was a, a sobering lesson for the team. We realized that passage of um, Measure J in 1979, which was a, a growth control measure, has been really, really successful in protecting so many of our agricultural lands and, and limiting growth. But by the time Measure J was enacted in 1979 and the general plan and land use policies were updated as a result of that, so much parcelization had occurred in Santa Cruz County already, over 96,000 parcels. And again, when you, when you look at the development potential per the general plan for all of those parcels, you can start to see these patterns emerge. And while much of the development will be concentrated in urban areas, you can see the influence that development in the more rural areas could have in terms of habitat, fragmentation, and loss of connectivity. So this was a really um, important study for us, and it was a really key element in, in developing our recommendations. This is a, a summary uh, of some of our recommendations where we recommend we should focus conservation priorities. Our team identified these eight geographic areas, including the sand hills that Jody mentioned, as well as critical streams that provide habitat for coho and steelhead and other resources, as the kind of the top priorities to focus our conservation efforts. And while there are, are many important areas that fall outside of these, um, biodiversity hotspots, for example, or farms that would be really strategic um, to secure conservation easements, all in all, these are the places where, by focusing conservation, we can achieve multiple benefits. So protection of biodiversity, protection of long-term habitat connectivity, protection of water resources, and opportunities to um, provide new recreational opportunities. And these areas also take into consideration <coughs> the, the, the potential for development in some of these rural areas. It'll take a long time to implement this. This area represents more than 100 and about 112,000 acres. Over 20,000 acres are currently protected within these multi-benefit priority areas. But that it's important to note that by conservation, we don't just mean buying land outright. Conservation also means stewardship. And so these boundaries were drawn to reflect watershed boundaries or more um, eco-regional or physical boundaries um, where we need to take uh, a more comprehensive approach to conservation that addresses land, fee land protection as well as stewardship. It'll require so many tools to get there. Um, again, Santa Cruz County has a really excellent general plan and land use policies and we recognize the importance of um, supporting policies and regulations, but there are many other incredibly important tools. This may sound a little counterintuitive coming from a representative from a land trust, but one of the main recommendations in the blueprint was that direct purchase of land, fee acquisition, need not be the major way we protect land. Stewardship incentives, um, these can be in the form of grants or programs like a farm bill that provide incentives to landowners to steward their resources can be a far more cost-effective way than just outright land purchase and what will allow us to focus conservation efforts over a much larger geographic area than just those expensive parcel-by-parcel -parcel transactions. Conservation easements are another really important opportunity, something the Land Trust and other organizations have employed so successfully over the years. Uh, conservation easements allow working lands in particular to remain in production uh, and on the tax rolls to help fund local government services. And so that's another very important tool. I described payments for ecosystem services earlier. Again, this is a, a fairly new and emerging field, um, but it basically recognizes the benefits that come from natural areas. Clean water, clean air, 
habitat pollination, and it strives to place an economic value on the provision of those services. Again, the Nature Conservancy was, has been very successful in exploring these models in their Garcia River project up north, and a number of organizations and agencies locally are exploring some studies to kick off some pilot ecosystem um, service payments in Santa Cruz County. Again, land purchase does have a role in the blueprint. There are those sites where the landowners are just going to be possibly interested in selling, um, where that might be the only way to ensure the long-term protection of critically rare biological resources, for example. And then partnerships are going to be absolutely critical. All of the previous strategies benefit from people getting to head and collaborating on their implementation. The conservation blueprint is online. I encourage you to go to the Land Trust website, www.landtrustsantacruz.org. Please take a look, please download it. All of the maps that we showed are available online and the GIS data that we used to create the maps should be available by the end of the month. And again, this is about the next generation. It's been a huge opportunity and pleasure for us to make this investment in the next generation and try to pass on uh, a legacy of land protection and stewardship. If you're gonna remember three things, could you please think about this when, after the, you go home um, tonight? And that is, number one, Santa Cruz has spectacular natural and working landscapes. Number two, those landscapes are at risk. And three, the blueprint is a roadmap to help us address those problems. And um, why, why a photo of natural bridges to close with? Well, it's fitting because did you know that, that natural bridges was protected during the Great Depression? Along with Point Lobos, Sunset Beach, Seacliff Beach, we know we're challenged right now in our economic times, but with everything you've seen um, tonight, I, I would encourage you to believe as we do that it is now our turn to act.